Hello and welcome to the Mindful Men podcast, the show helping men to open up about manhood. My name is Simon Rennie and my aim is to get men talking. From mental health to fatherhood and everything in between, Mindful Men creates a safe space for conversation. Now, before we get into this episode, I want to say a huge thank you for joining me. It means a world for you to join me and talk about men's issues. And if you love what you hear, please subscribe and share the episode with your mates. You can also join the conversation on Instagram and YouTube, and I'd love to connect with you there. But for now, sit back, relax, and let's get mindful. G'day, guys, and welcome to episode seven of the Mindful Men podcast. My name is Simon Rennie, and I'm the man behind Mindful Men. Over the last few episodes, I've touched on the concept of self-care. And I know for many people, as soon as you say the word self-care, they roll their eyes and think of hippies having a yoga retreat or the wife and her girlfriends going for a facial and a massage. But in today's episode, I want to break it down a bit. I want to highlight that it's more than facials and massages. I want to highlight that it's not reserved for hippies or the missus and her friends. In fact, blokes can benefit from self-care too. And not every now and then, but as a regular everyday thing. Why? Because self-care is critical to managing our overall health and well-being. Now, before I get into things, let me take you down a walk through memory lane. Think back to when you were growing up. If you're my age, you were a kid in the late 80s and 90s. Think about your parents growing up. Think about your uncles or aunts, or your grandparents or other adults in your life. How many of them talked about self-care? Nobody I knew did. And the only remnant of self-care that came into conversation was whether you had the apple a day to keep the dentist away. Now, imagine back then if you talked about taking time for self-care. You'd probably feel selfish or be perceived as selfish. You were more likely to be seen as putting your needs in front of the needs of your family or friends. And this mindset might continue until today because you've been socially conditioned to think of self-care in this way. Self-care is a hard concept for people to grasp for reasons just like this. But it's essential if we're going to fight off mental illness or even recover from it. In the mental health or self-development spaces, we often hear about this concept of filling our cup. When our cup is full, we're ready to give our all. But if our cup starts to deplete, and let's say it's half full, then we can only give half of our all. Now, the cup can be filled with self-care. And the more we do it, the easier it is to regain that full cup. Doing a little bit every day makes it manageable. But unfortunately, many of us wait until the cup is empty to take stock and implement some genuine self-care. Kind of like I did when I burned out at the end of 2020. Now, along the way, we can at times think we're doing self-care. But whilst the positive effects of what we're doing might be there, they can be short-lived and sometimes negatively impact our health and well-being. So in thinking about this, in thinking about our cup, if we can't effectively fill our cup, how can we give our all to others? How do we support those who need us? How do we foster positive and healthy relationships if all we're doing is white-knuckling life? In essence, we can't give from an empty cup. So how do we fill it? Well, as I said before, it's more than just facials and massages. Part of the process is becoming mindful of good and not so good self-care. And this comes down to understanding how different brain chemicals impact us. Now, go easy on me here because I'm not a medical professional, but we also don't need to be to have a basic idea of how our brains operate. There's four brain chemicals that I want to chat about today, and these get released when we do certain things. Sometimes they're called the happiness chemicals or happy hormones. 
And these are dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphins. So let's have a quick look at these and see how they might impact our self-care regime. The first one is dopamine. Dopamine makes us feel good. It gives us pleasure when we do things like complete a task or do self-care. We also get it when we eat or celebrate something. We get it having sex or winning at something. We even get it when we're celebrating hard at the pub. Maybe it's for a birthday or a job promotion or just catching up with mates. Alternatively, taking drugs can give us the same feeling. Now, when you look at all these examples, self-care is in just about all of them. We treat ourselves with some chalky. But sometimes the square can turn into a row or even a whole block. Or a couple of beers turns into a bender. Whilst dopamine is great in the short term, it can be addictive. And this can result in self-care regimes that don't actually fill our cup. So like anything in life, dopamine requires balance. Too little can lead to things like depression and too much can lead to addictive behaviors and even aggression. Ways to balance dopamine with self-care include healthy eating, good sleep and exercise, and medication can also help if needed. Second on the list is serotonin. Serotonin helps with stabilizing our mood. Have you ever been in a bit of a stressed or angry or anxious moment and then gone for a run and only to find that when you finish you're in a much better mood? Well, serotonin helps produce this. It makes us feel happier and also helps us to sleep and think. It can also be produced by getting outside in the sun, meaning that you can also go for a walk for a similar benefit. Or if walking is not your jam, maybe a swim or meditation or even a bike ride will help. Now, like dopamine, if you don't have enough serotonin, you might experience depression or anxiety. You might feel down or bad about yourself. You might have issues with sleeping and feel like smashing a whole chocolate block in one go. Conversely, too much serotonin can lead to headaches or restlessness or even other health issues. Exercise is great for serotonin, particularly if it's outside, but also eating right, meditating, yoga, and even therapy are great ways to make sure that it's in balance. The third of the happiness chemicals is oxytocin, and this is the touchy-feely one. Think about giving your kids a hug or smooching with the missus. You can get it from a massage or petting your dog. When you do these things, you get a hit of this happy hormone. But it's also essential for things like breastfeeding or making testosterone and moving sperm. Oxytocin also helps us build relationships and plays a role in us building trust, empathy and bonding with others. Now, from what I've read, having too little appears to be linked to depression and even social phobias. Therapeutic or medical interventions seem to be the ways of balancing oxytocin levels, but natural methods include getting your cuddle on. And let's be honest, who doesn't like a cuddle? And then there is the lucky last, endorphins. Endorphins are our body's natural pain reliever. When we get a rush of these, we can push through pain despite being hurt. Like when you've torn your hammy trying to get back into footy again for the first time in 10 years, but you still manage to make that final run to try and score a goal. Whether or not you did score is another thing altogether, but endorphins helped you push through that pain for a short period after the injury. But endorphins are more than just an inbuilt pain reliever. They also produce as a reward system, like when we are exercising or eating or even having sex. It also comes from being artistic or listening to music, dancing and having a good old belly laugh. Now, if you don't have enough endorphins in your body, again, it can lead to things like depression or anxiety, difficulty sleeping and even mood swings. However, there is also such thing as having too many endorphins and this can result in addictive behaviours such as hurting yourself to feel that rush or even exercising too much. And like anything, balance here is the key. 
So there you have it, a quick dive into the happy hormones, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphins. What we can see here is the things that release these hormones are all related to self-care and they can all fill our cup. Things like exercise and eating right, socializing and getting out in the sun. It could be petting the dog or cat, cuddles with the kids, sex, and even facials and massages. These are all ways to increase the happy hormones and fill our cup. Now, before I go, I want to bring us back to last week's episode and quickly touch on the notion that self-care is holistic. A holistic approach for me includes knowledge. When we know a bit about ourselves and our minds and bodies and how they work, we become mindful of what we need from life. And this allows us to be mindful of what we're doing, what we're consuming, our relationships and our purpose. And with this comes an understanding that when our cups are getting low, we need to do some self-care. And this can be any of the things I've talked about today, from socialising to eating to cuddles and kisses. But it can be so much more than that. It can be going to therapy, getting meds or taking a holiday. It could be reading a book, watching TV, studying, learning a musical instrument building something, planting something, pulling weeds, or even mowing the lawn. It can be cleaning the car or going fishing, going to the footy, doing yoga, writing poetry, going to a comedy club, getting your finances in order or decluttering your house, painting your nails or getting a new haircut, changing the music you listen to and going for a skydive, or just talking about how you're tracking. And I like this last one because, as I've said before, talking helps with mental illness. And when we talk about mental illness, we normalize it like we have our physical health. We put shame to bed and get the help that we need. So that's it. How to fill your cup with happiness hormones. It's pretty simple stuff, but we often don't give it much thought. Thanks for joining me today. My name is Simon Rennie. And until next time, stay mindful. Well, that's a wrap for today's episode and I hope you got some value from it. If anything triggered your mental health today, please reach out to your support networks. Also, if you love what you heard, be sure to subscribe to the show and share it with your mates. For more from Mindful Men, you can check us out on Instagram and YouTube and I'll throw the links to these pages in the show notes below. But until next time, stay mindful.